Hello, everyone. Um, on behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, INTAC, and the INTAC Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Daniel Kirby, PhD, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director, ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker. After careers as an analytical chemist in semiconductor electronics, pharmaceuticals, and academic research, Dan turned his interest to conservation. He currently works both in private practice and as a volunteer in the scientific research lab at the MFA Boston, specializing in application of mass spectrometry in art and cultural heritage with a particular interest in protein identification. The title for today's talk is Protein Analysis in Conservation via Peptide Mass Fingerprinting, Examples from Art and Cultural Heritage. Conservation has recently been adopting new analytical methods from biotechnology for the analysis of proteinaceous materials. One of these methods is peptide master, mass fingerprinting, PMF, a relatively simple technique, but one that offers unprecedented sensitivity and specificity and provides conservators with new information heretofore impossible to achieve. This talk will discuss the current practice of PMF and show examples of its application in art and cultural heritage. Interspersed throughout the talk will be examples of new approaches to the often controversial subject of invasive sampling. Before I invite Dan Kirby to give the talk, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please type in your name, organization name and email ID in the chat box and also your, uh, um, and also the questions, we'll be taking those right at the end of the talk. Over to you, Dan. Welcome. Um, greetings from the East Coast of the US where the sun is just coming up. So we'll get started. So the subject of the talk today is protein analysis in conservation. And I'm gonna be uh, dealing with specifically one technique called peptide mass fingerprinting. And I will give you a, an introduction to MALDI analysis, which is a mass spec technique, which you may or may not be familiar with, but it's part of this, um, this type of analysis. And I'll introduce you to peptide mass fingerprinting. So, and then we'll give some examples of TMF used to identify what I will call kitchen proteins. And you'll understand why we ca I call them that in a few minutes, but uh, I, to identify kitchen proteins in art and cultural objects. And then we'll move on to a, 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 another application of PMF, which is similar, but uh, in, a, in a different vein to the identification of collagen-based proteins, as well as their origin. And interspersed through the talk, as uh, Padma said, I will talk about some of the challenges and solutions to sampling. This is a, an often controversial uh, subject in our conservation and I'll give you lots of examples. So my ob objective here is to introduce you to the use of peptide mass fingerprinting and show us a lot of examples of where it has been applied by me and others so that you have, have a, a sense of what types of problems or what types of questions you might be able to ask in your work with conservation and cultural heritage. So we're, first of all, where do we find proteins in art and conservation? The kitchen proteins, and I call them that because if you'll notice that the, the types of proteins we're dealing with here all really originate in the kitchen, eggs and, and casein and animal glues and things like that. And so the kitchen proteins will be this set of, of materials and you'll see where they are used in art. And they'll be found in paint binders and grounds and coatings on paper and photographs and objects and in all types of glues, for example, furniture glues. And then we'll move on to the collagen-based protein, which is another very large set of materials that is found pervasively in cultural heritage, such as in leather and parchment, in book bindings, et cetera, and many, many mammalian-based objects that we uh, encounter that are made from hide and gut and tendon, et cetera. So just very briefly, the idea of analyzing proteins in conservation is not new. Uh, the very earliest methods that were used were hydrolysis and amino acid analysis. And this one, this technique uh, gave some information, it indicated the presence of a, a protein and gave some hints as to where it might have originated. 
nowadays we use FTIR not so much to identify proteins, but just to uh, detect their presence in an object and decide whether we should go on to another technique to identify them further. There's also been some use of immunostaining and ELISA, which is a targeted technique, and HPLC with either UV or mass spec detection. Most recently, we have been very fortunate in the conservation world to be able to take advantage of the, um, the techniques that are being developed in the proteomics world, and particularly LCMSMS or LC tandem mass spectrometry, and another technique called peptide mass fingerprinting, which originated with the, the biotechnology people. And this is one that I will focus on today for reasons that I hope will become very clear. So this is all you need to know about proteins in order to understand peptide mass fingerprinting. The, uh, the structure of a protein is a, is a, a random, not a random, but a very specific uh, assemblage of amino acids. And they, the, um, the sequence of amino acids in a given protein is unique to that protein. So if we use an enzyme to cut the protein at specific sites, and in this case, we'll use trypsin, which cuts at these very specific sites, we, had, we uh, put together a peptide, We've de we produce a peptide mixture. Since all protein sequences are unique, the mixture of peptides is unique. And it's this mixture of unique peptides that we analyze and produce a peptide mass fingerprint. And this is work that was developed in the early 2000s by Hensel and Watanabe, and it is used pretty pervasively in, in biotechnology. It's a very inexpensive, quick and easy way of analyzing relatively pure proteins or very simple mixtures of proteins. The MALDI analysis is the technique that we use to, uh, to analyze the mixture, this unique mixture of peptides. And this is a relatively simple technique. It can be uh, used by, uh, after maybe a half hour of uh, introduction to it, almost anyone can use this kind of an instrument. And it's based on the idea that if you have a sample on a sample plate or target plate and you shine a laser onto it, you ionize the sample, it's analyzed in a, uh, a, re a reflector. And the basis of the operation is that the lighter ions will fly faster and the heavier ions will fly slower. And they're detected as, as time of entry or time of detection at the detector. And that flight time is uh, translated into uh, mass. The real, this was the subject, the, the idea of doing a MALDI analysis was the subject of a Nobel Prize in 2002. And it wasn't so much the instrumentation that was the, uh, the, the subject of the uh, Nobel Prize, but the idea of being able to analyze materials with a laser, with laser desorption that wouldn't ordinarily be ionized. And the idea is that if you mix the analyte, which these, these guys here would be the analyte ions with a matrix, the matrix absorbs the UV radiation and transfers its energy to the analytes, which would not otherwise be uh, able to be ionized. And that was really the subject of the, uh, the Nobel Prize. So we'll talk first about PMF analysis of the kitchen proteins, as I call them. And we've very simply to do this uh, operation, we digest the protein with trypsin and analyze it with MALDI, uh, MALDI mass spectrometry and produce a spectrum of peptide masses. And this is the way we normally see a peptide um, uh, spectrum. And the idea is to identify the proteins in artworks or cultural heritage. We use specific peptide masses as markers for the various components that we're looking for. And so this is a list of ions that we would find that are associated with the egg white and egg yolk and animal glues and casein and fish, for example. And so it's just a matter of producing a spectrum, matching up the ions that we see and being able to identify where the, the ions came from. And this is what the spectrum or the mass fingerprint, if you want to call it that, would look like. It's, the, uh, it's a, a MALDI spectrum with the ion, with the markers uh, in it and it'd be, uh, the analysis really just re, uh, requires uh, matching up the ions in the spectrum with the ions in the list of 
known materials. As an example, this is a 14, uh, 14th century uh, tempera painting uh, from the Harvard Art Museums. And the, well, a very small particle from this upper corner was analyzed by peptide mass fingerprinting, produced this kind of a spectrum. And from this, this spectrum, it illustrates a couple of things. One is that we can detect uh, the presence of whole leg because we can identify ions that are associated with both the egg glare and the egg yolk. And we can also identify the presence of animal glue based on these ions uh, that are associated with uh, animal collagen. Uh, so what are the, the, the uh, idea of doing peptide mass fingerprinting is uh, that you can analyze both individual proteins and sometimes are relatively simple mixtures. And this, this spectrum was produced by a, a particle of the paint uh, taken from the object that was this size, a relatively large uh, sample of material. And another example where the particles, and I don't have pictures of these because the, the samples that I was given for this analysis were at very, very uh, fine particles. Uh, and I've indicated here, most of them were invisible to the naked eye. Uh, but even with those relatively small uh, sample sizes in this painting by Alfred Volpe, the um, Brazilian uh, modernist painter, we were able to identify in his, in his background the presence of collagen and egg yolk and egg glare, and in the green and yellow uh, uh, parts, uh, other egg products. And so this verified what uh, was thought to uh, be his um, the materials that he used in his um, in his paintings. So the so that is how we use peptide mass fingerprinting for some of the common materials found in, for example, paintings. In the other area that I want to talk about is the uh, area of collagen-based materials, which are uh, quite pervasive in cultural heritage. Collagen is a, when we're dealing in this case with collagen type one, which comprises something like 25 to 35% of the protein weight in mammals. Uh, it's composed of two identical alpha one chains and one slightly different alpha two chains. And about 99% of this protein is the same in, uh, in mammals, but there are slight differences from one mammal to the other. And what we'll be dealing with is the polypeptide chain, the smallest uh, unit of this uh, highly organized um, protein. And in this, this is a blow up of the polypeptide chain. So this is the, this is what the actual collagen protein would look like with uh, two chains, two identical chains and one slightly different chain. As a function of evolution, Small differences come into this chain based on, uh, and these are occur in very specific parts of the protein, which we can uh, arbitrarily indicate as A, B, and C if you want. So this is not a matter of the evolutionary differences uh, from one mammal to the other being random in the chain, but they are usually associated with very specific regions. And so in order to use this, these differences that occur uh, from one mammal to the other. For example, if we had uh, this, say the A region and a, uh, you know, over evolutionary time, uh, a, a one amino acid was um, changed to another amino acid and we did the, the uh, peptide mass fingerprinting by MALDI analysis, then we would end up with a spectrum from these two that are slightly different. And so we use these slight differences from one mammal to the other from one source of collagen to the other as a way of determining the origin of the material. So if, for example, and this is a tabulation now of uh, the various regions that I pointed out uh, on the chain where these differences can occur. And so we notice in the, if for example, we had a spectrum that had these markers in it, we simply go to the table of the masses that we have defined that indicate uh, the source of the, of the collagen. And uh, we can see that the 1208 
there's three occurrences of that here. And so we go to the next uh, region, the B region, and can eliminate um, this, the water buffalo, because its B region is different, and et cetera, going on and find out that when we get down to this other region of the peptide, uh, where uh, the difference um, has occurred, we can identify the source of the material as being cattle as opposed to muskox, for instance. So this is just a matter of uh, getting the markers, uh, identifying the markers in the spectrum, going to the table, look them up and identify the, the source. Uh, this, as this, these tables are growing and the, the number of references are growing uh, because there's quite a few people adding into this, uh, we're developing uh, some automated uh, methods for doing this type of analysis for the lookup kind of analysis. Um, to do the actual analysis, the digestion and MALDI preparation is really very straightforward. The digestion protocol is a matter of putting a sample in an Eppendorf tube, adding a buffer and heating it uh, to extract some of the collagen. And this is typically done for maybe 75 degrees for an hour or so. Digest with trypsin for two hours or overnight is usually more convenient. Mix the, the digested peptides with the MALDI matrix and spot it onto a sample plate and then do the MALDI analysis. Once the sample is on the, the, the plate and dried and the, and the sample in this case is really a mixture of the, the, the matrix and co-crystallized with it are the peptides that we produce. So once this mixture has crystallized on the sample plate, it's, it's relatively, it's, it's stable almost indefinitely and can be taken to uh, instrumentation wherever that may be. Um, and just as an aside, not, most labs don't have their own MALDI instrumentation. However, most universities do have uh, instrumentation. And in my experience, they are always very um, uh, anxious and eager to help uh, if, um, if we had samples to, uh, from cultural heritage and art to analyze, they're usually very cooperative and will uh, work with us to do the analysis. The analysis itself, <clears throat> the MALDI analysis itself only takes a few minutes per sample. So um, it's quite easy to do. We talked about sample sizes and originally I would have said, this is a, this is a rough idea of the size of the sample that we would need to do a, a successful uh, peptide mass fingerprint. And actually that's probably way overkill. And my usual <clears throat> comments to uh, someone who is obtaining a sample is that if you can see it, if you can physically see the sample uh, at 30X magnification, then it's still way, way more than you actually need. So this is an extremely sensitive technique. And as you can see from the, the idea of being able to uh, identify sources of collagen, it's a very spe specific technique. This is really all the equipment you need, pipettes and uh, a heating block, and that's almost the only <clears throat> lab equipment that you need, and maybe two square feet of uh, lab space. So it's really a, not a very difficult technique to, to use and can be implemented relatively easy in almost any lab. <clears throat> and we typically run samples in, in batches of maybe 10 or 15. <clears throat> And this is the end result. Peptides are in solution and we mix this with the matrix and spot it onto the sample plate. And here you can see the samples are crystallized. And in this form, as I said, <clears throat> samples are uh, stable pretty indefinitely and don't have to be analyzed instantly after they're spotted onto the plate, but can very easily be taken to the instrumentation that uh, you may have. As an example, <clears throat> this was a uh, a potential gift to the, uh, the MFA in Boston. And because of CITES concerns, which is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, uh, we had to determine whether any of the components of this object were uh, on the CITES list. And the first sample that we took was from this belting material. And the sample itself was just a tiny snip off the end of this fiber from the belt. And this produces the peptide mass fingerprint that could be identified as caribou, which is not a CITES problem. And the way this analysis is done, again, I'll just point out that you uh, correlate the ions that you see in the spectrum with the markers 
in the, in the table that we have and can identify this is coming from caribou, also known as reindeer. You'll also, <clears throat> also notice that not every uh, reference material is unique. So for example, cattle and bison are so closely associated, uh, uh, co closely related that they, their collagen is identical and they can't be di distinguished from each other. Uh, and similarly, um, groups like rabbits can't be told apart necessarily. And, uh, and deer. So <clears throat> the idea of uh, these examples that I've shown so far deal with relatively large uh, samples and samples are relatively easy to obtain. The sample from the, uh, the panel painting, the, the first uh, example I showed of the, um, uh, the painting where there was a, a fairly large piece that was taken from a, the the painting, that was actually the remnants of a sample that was taken to do a cross section. In the case of the, uh, the carved object, the, it was ex extremely easy to uh, obtain a sample of the belting material and, uh, because it was, um, it was very uh, innocuous and could be taken without uh, severely altering the object itself. However, uh, these are not, this is not always the case, and uh, if there are conservators among you out there, you will understand that um, you, uh, it's, it's not always easy to obtain samples from objects without somehow altering the appearance of them. And so we've been developing several techniques for, uh, I, I won't call it non-invasive sampling, which is kind of a misnomer, but minimally invasive sampling or sampling for the protein analysis that uh, doesn't uh, sig significantly alter the, the object. And so the one technique that we've been working on is using small pieces of vinyl erasers to sample um, friable coatings, coatings that are easily uh, detached from a surface like a fixative on paper. It's also uh, used for sampling parchment and leather. Actually, if you looked at a parchment under a microscope, you'd see that the surface is very uh, flaky um, and that the vinyl eraser cube is actually uh, just uh, abrading a small amount of material and then picking it up by static electricity. This is also a very convenient way of picking up and transferring powder, powdery materials and very small particles. And I'll show you some examples of this. But the whole idea is that in order, this is a, Mass fingerprinting is a destructive technique and it requires a sample, of, although it's a very uh, small sample, uh, it does requ physically require a sample. And so um, in order to uh, make it possible to sample a, a large variety of objects, we've been working on ways of minimizing the interaction or minimizing the effect or the consequences to the object that's being sampled. So in the one case, and this, this work is based on uh, work that Sarah Fittiman and her colleagues in um, York University in the UK uh, did in, uh, I think it was 2015 or so that they did this work using vinyl erasers to sample parchment to, for a study of of uh, vellum from 13th century, mostly Bibles. And what they did was to send out kits with uh, small pieces of vinyl eraser and they asked the various owners of the uh, parchment objects to uh, abrade the surface and send them, uh, abrade a small part of the surface and send back to them the, the crumbs or the eraser crumbs and that the material that was abraded from the surface of the parchment and incorporated into the eraser crumbs was then analyzed for, uh, to determine the source of the parchment. I've modified this slightly and instead of using the crumbs uh, from the eraser, we simply abrade the surface very slightly and it automatically, the, the vinyl eraser cube automatically picks up uh, and uh, by static electricity and adheres very fine particles of the parchment surface or the coating on the parchment or the coating on the paper. And then that is uh, put into the uh, the Eppendorf tube, and this is digested uh, in this way. As an example, 
this is a, uh, a sketch by um, John Constable that was in the uh, National Gallery in Scotland. And we sent eraser cubes to the conservator and he was able to obtain samples uh, with just with a few simple instructions, send them back to us and we could determine from the resulting uh, peptide mass fingerprint that the coating on this, the fixative on this constable sketch was a fish-based uh, fixative, which was consistent with other um, uh, constable sketches that we have uh, analyzed in the past. Uh, the point here is that this, this, this is a very easy way of obtaining a sample of this uh, type of material and it can be done by someone who is uh, like a conservator who has not necessarily been uh, trained or has been using this for a long period of time. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, <clears throat> this can also be used for sampling, uh, for example, leather. <clears throat> um, a lot of conservators or book uh, conservators would tell you that they can uh, tell the source of the leather in a binding by looking at a the pore pattern of the leather. And this is often uh, very tricky to do uh, and it's very inaccurate. Um, so by using the vinyl eraser approach, we can um, abrade a small portion of the leather and um, produce a spectrum that we can then use to identify the source of the leather. You'll notice here that there's a slight <clears throat> cleaning of the surface. And one of the issues that comes up with this type of sampling is that there's the surface contamination, which in almost all cases is dust and dirt from uh, the storage area, the laboratory, the museum. And it's almost entirely made up of, of keratin. And the keratin, is, the source of the keratin is almost always skin flakes, which is the major component of the dust and dirt. And so in the spectrum that we see from this type of sampling, there's a lot of keratin contamination involved. And so how we uh, approach this or how we minimize this is usually to do multiple passes uh, with an eraser cube, uh, with a, a clean eraser cube uh, in the same spot. And the second pass, the first pass is, is used to clean the surface and the second pass is used to do the identification. And you can see here that in the, the first pass, the blue, the keratin ions are fairly prominent. In the second pass, they're very, very uh, diminished. So we use this as a way of uh, minimizing a surface contamination. Another case where we've used uh, vinyl eraser cubes is to transfer very small paint particles. <clears throat> this is an example from painted Sajido doors uh, from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The, the painting on this is a, is a very lightly bound uh, material uh, and the very lightly bound means that when you try to remove any of it, um, it's very staticky and tends to fly away. It's very difficult to, to remove any of this paint uh, for analysis and place it into this, for example, an Eppendorf tube. So what we have been doing with uh, the conservators at um, Philadelphia is to, um, under uh, magnification uh, while we're sampling to abrade a small piece of the painting with possibly with a scalpel and then put it onto or take it up onto a, one of the vinyl eraser cubes. So this is just a way of sort of sopping up the, the um, small bits of paint that we have uh, abraded. This is really very important in this case because the paint was so very thin and, and lightly bound, very little binder in the material. <clears throat> but even at that, we're able to identify that the binder here uh, is uh, collagen or some kind of an animal glue. Another example of using eraser cubes to um, pick up small particles with the study <clears throat> that we did with, with um, some of the materials from the uh, the glass flowers exhibit at Harvard University. <clears throat> and if you're ever in the Boston area, <clears throat> I would highly recommend that you visit this display. It is probably one of the most amazing collections of objects that you'll ever run into. These were um, flower models that were, were uh, put together uh, and are part of, uh, of a display at, um, at Harvard that is 
and we were <clears throat> um, part of a project or part of a study to understand the, the painting itself. These are called glass flowers and the colors on them are very rarely are, is it colored glass. More often than not, the, the coloring is uh, uh, paint particles or pigment particles that are very lightly attached to the surface with a, some kind of a glue. And so the, the, uh, we had uh, samples uh, of the glass with the binders and the pigments on there. And the idea was to try to get enough of this material to uh, do the peptide mass fingerprint analysis. And we found that using the eraser cubes, it was really quite easy to abrade a small amount of material from the surface and take it up onto the eraser. And we can see, and this actually was a, a lot of interesting results from this study. Uh, the, the makers of these objects used a, a variety of um, materials to adhere and bind the pigments to the surface. And in a lot of cases, they turned out to be fish-based materials. Not quite sure why they chose that, but that was what we were, were finding in, very, in a lot of these. Another sampling challenge comes in. So we talked about using surface or analyzing surfaces or sampling surfaces where the material, the parchment or the fixative can be detached relatively easily. In other cases where you're dealing with solids, uh, it's a little bit different challenge. And so in this case, we're using fine alumina or diamond polishing films. And when I say fine, particles, I mean, larger particles would be something on the order of 30 microns, which is a, like a 600 grit uh, uh, polishing film, and smaller particles down to a micron or sometimes less, which would be something like a 14,000 uh, grit. And so we, I've, we've been using these to sample hard surfaces and coatings on objects. And this is what they look like in practice. It's just a small piece of the polishing film attached to a polystyrene support just to make it easy to, to handle. And once the sample is abraded and, and entrapped in the polishing film, it's clipped off and put into a, the sampling tube. So in the case of our, uh, the, this object that we looked at before, the other part that had to be looked at was the belt buckle, which appeared to be ivory or bone. And so using this type of a polishing film, or just this, this uh, configuration, we were able to abrade a tiny bit of the belt buckle um, and analyze that. And it turned out that this was walrus ivory and not a CITES problem. Um, the advantage of doing this type of analysis is that you can find, usually find a place on a, on a bone or ivory object that is uh, very easy to sample that, that even if you uh, braid a small amount of the surface that it's not, uh, it's not something that would be noticeable. And so the conservators that I've worked with in doing these types of analysis are, have usually been pretty receptive to the idea because it is quite uh, non-invasive or very minimally invasive. Uh, the same technique has been used with uh, a lot, quite a few objects. These are from the, uh, the Getty Museum, um, and these are archaeological materials and were very easy to sample using the, the sample sticks that I just showed you. And we can identify things such as cattle bone and elephant ivory uh, as making up these um, objects. And a very uh, to, um, a recent study, we used the, the same idea uh, in a very extreme case, and that was the, uh, to sample um, coatings on photographs. And this was published um, a few months ago in the uh, Journal of the American Institute of Conservation. Um, and we chose to use uh, photographs because they are kind of an extreme case of uh, being uh, the, the effects on the surface or, or minimizing the effects on the surface. And we found that with the abrasive films, <clears throat> with the least invasive configuration that we came up with, which was a, a one and a half millimeter disc with a one micron film, which looked sort of like this, we were able to sample the coating on this photograph. It was actually from the study collection. And the, the, the uh, effect on the, on the film 
on the photograph was really very minimal. So the only way we could pick up uh, any of the differences or any uh, ch change in the surface or alteration of the surface was by SEM at, at 100x. <clears throat> and the effect that we saw was that there were some new and elongated fissures. This crackling uh, uh, pattern on this is a very uh, characteristic of an albumin coated painting. So we, we chose this, um, these samples as kind of an extreme case to uh, see how, uh, how minimally we could interact with the surface and still get uh, reasonable data. And this was from that configuration that I just saw, even with a uh, very minimal interaction with the surface, we were able to obtain a spectrum um, uh, that could identify this coating as albumin. Um, another case recently, uh, the group from the Metropolitan Museum and the University of Bordeaux and the Morgan Library use the same configuration, same idea to study the fixatives on a selection of <clears throat> Gainsborough drawings. Uh, and this is the, um, the these drawings were uh, of interest because there is an indication that Gainsborough used cow's milk as a fixative to um, protect the, the pigments and, but the, um, but there could, there was no fixative that could be visually observed. And so through this sampling, they were able to find that yes, there was a cow's milk that was used uh, as thought, but had never been verified. So this is another example where the, we're able to sample the surface very easily and um, come up with uh, relatively, uh, quickly uh, the analytical information that was uh, look, they were looking for. And this was published in um, Heritage Science um, about two months ago, I think. So with all this talk of sampling methods, the idea is not to try to come up with a, uh, a, a technique that is applicable to every possible uh, object or situation that wants to be sampled. But what we're rather trying to do is show different options for obtaining samples. And they, as Annette Manick, uh, one of the co-authors on the paper with the photograph said, they provide a situation dependent option. So given whatever situation you have for sampling, here are some of the options that you can use. So, in summary, I've shown you or it introduced you to uh, MALDI analysis and PMF analysis to obtain uh, protein identifications. And we've showed some applications to what I've termed kitchen proteins and also the collagen based proteins. And so not only determine that there are collagen based proteins present, but determine the, the origin of the material. And we talked a little bit about sampling challenges and solutions. So in the time that I have left, I'd like to, well, first of all, thank all the people that have contributed to this work. And these, uh, I've had the very good fortune of working with a, a lot of really uh, terrific people in a lot of different uh, projects. And I thank all of them for their con continued support of the things that I'm trying to do. But now I'd like to, um, uh, well, I'm leaving you with my uh, email and I, I, there are questions that come up that we can't answer uh, this morning. And also if you have projects that you'd be interested in discussing, I've, I am always open to looking to do collaborations. Um, and now I'm just gonna show you a few other examples of the types of objects that um, some of, the, some of them are kind of strange looking things, but uh, they are uh, objects that people have wanted to know more information about the proteins involved. So some exceptional examples. This was a project to study the materials in this sledge, the dog sledge that came from um, Admiral Peary's uh, exploration in the, um, the, uh, at the Arctic. And this was part of a uh, exhibit uh, at the Peabody Museum. And we studied all of the, these various materials that you can see. There's, there's bone, 
there's sinew and there's this other material under here that was used as the runners and using the, the mostly the, um, the um, polishing film techniques, we were able to identify a, a quite a few materials in these in this sledge. And probably one of the most interesting was the idea of using narwhal ivory. And if you see this, the skids, the runners on the bottom of this sledge, these are all pieces of narwhal ivory that have been pieced together and, so, and uh, kept held in place with sinew. Another object that came, uh, this was from the Manila collection and uh, this medallion, which uh, dates to something like 1600, for a long time sat in there in the uh, museum and they were convinced that it was wood. Uh, but Cori Rogi um, had her doubts and so she sent a piece, a, a small uh, piece of this along and we were able to find out that it was actually, uh, the origin was actually a rhinoceros. And so this would be like the cross section of a rhinoceros horn. And I'll just point out here that the, right, the horns are, are not collagen, but they're keratin. So another large um, class of materials that are part of cultural heritage are the keratins. And these would be materials that make up horn and hoof and feathers and uh, hair. And there is a uh, parallel work going on, to work that's parallel to the work with collagen to develop markers for the keratinaceous materials. Interestingly, when, when I reported back to the uh, Corey Rogi this result, and she said that the, she brought this to the attention of the curator and the curator's direct quote was, well, this is much more interesting than just wood. And then he went off to ponder rhinoceros material trade patterns through history, which is a lot of excitement for him. I thought that was quite an interesting comment. Another very um, interesting and actually beautiful object that I, I had a, a chance to work on was this uh, baby carrier from the um, Chinese, the Dong uh, ethnic minority, uh, which is a group that's primarily in the Yunnan area of China. And we we're interested in understanding what this shiny coating was on the, on the baby carrier. And it turns out that this was a mixture of chicken and duck egg glare. And the way this, this, this um, material is made is that it's first dyed with indigo and then it's coated multiple times usually with uh, the egg glare, uh, probably egg glare mixed with water. And once that's dried, they calendar it or pound it to give it this shiny appearance. Another very strange object, and I don't know if anyone has ever seen one of these, the Dr. Aoju paper mache models. These were models that were made, uh, I don't know the dates, I think probably in the 1800s, since anatomical models were, uh, and it, Models for studying anatomy were very uh, rare. Uh, this, uh, these were produced as sort of take apart models to teach anatomy. And the, uh, the, uh, the collection that was given to the um, university in Amsterdam, I believe, or the museum in Leiden, uh, they were deteriorating and we wanted to know what the materials were that were uh, used to make them and found that the the coatings on these were a mixture of cattle and fish glues. And so this helped the conservators to, uh, by understanding what the materials were that were degrading, they could uh, come up with ways of, of repairing and preserving them. Another interesting object that I had the, the luxury of working on was this uh, feather shield from uh, it's an Aztec feather shield, and we could determine that the materials that on the backside here were, came from New World deer. And yeah, and this set of uh, um, skin covered masks from the Cross River area in Africa. So this is the area on the sort of in the horn of, uh, of Africa. And it turned out that these were a combination of blue diker. These are very, very tiny. Um, antelopes and the skins were used to make these masks in most cases and there was one that was from ibex or a sheep and one that was unknown. So we still are um, 
there's still a very, I don't know how many mammals there are in, in, on the globe, but our collection of references only touches a very small portion of them. So we still come up with, with objects and materials that are unknown. There's currently a group of us that are working toward putting uh, together uh, an online database so that other workers that are doing peptide mass fingerprinting, especially with collagen and keratin, can input their, their markers, their newly discovered markers, and share them with uh, the rest of the workers. Um, this was a, um, a shadow puppet, which turned out to be made from goat skin. And as part of a, a large study that we did for the uh, National Center for Pre uh, Pre uh, Prevention Training and I forget what the other T is for. Uh, we studied a, a large collection of um, objects from the coastal uh, Native Americans. And this was one object that we did multiple samples from and we're able to identify a whole host of materials that went into making these child's boots. Uh, a current project with mummy portraits, which are portraits that are put on top of a, an embalmed mummy uh, and held in place with the, the wrapping. And under UV radiation, we've noticed this coating that's on here, which only extends as far as the wrapping would have gone. So it's not covering the whole, uh, the whole painting, the whole um, portrait but it's just put on after somehow, for some reason, after the, the shrouding is put on to hold it in place. It turned out that this was, uh, the, the coating on here is degraded whole egg. And we've recently carbon dated samples from two different portraits and they are in fact from about 2000 years ago. So the early um, uh, first or second century, which is where the portraits have been dated to. It's unclear why this is on, why this uh, uh, coating has been put on here, but this is, we're currently uh, sampling multiple of these paintings and finding the same thing. So the conservators are um, busily scratching their heads to try to understand why this was put on uh, the way it was. And finally, this is an example I'd love to show uh, as part of a, um, a workshop that I did with the group at Wintertour, the uh, uh, Wintertour University of Delaware program in art conservation. Each person that was part of that took part in the workshop brought in various objects that they were working on as part of their studies. And this bullwhip uh, that Cassie had brought in, uh, which was from the Explorers Club, was um, they would want it was it brought into the Explorers Club about a hundred years ago, and they wanted to think that it had somehow been an inspiration for the character Indiana Jones in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And so we we were analyzing we wanted to analyze the materials and sort of prove that it was yes this is something that would have come out uh, of Africa, for instance. It turned out that the material is actually bearded seal that made up this uh, bullwhip. And so rather than Indiana Jones, it was probably more likely the inspiration for Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean. And that's where I will leave you. If there are any questions, please, uh, we, I think we still have time for questions. Yeah. And if we don't get to your questions today, uh, there's my email address again, and please be in touch. And, um, and as I said before, I'd be very, uh, receptive to uh, working with people if they have um, materials questions that might be answerable by uh, doing the protein analysis. So thanks, Dan. Uh, you're not lucky. There are questions today. <laughs> so we're not letting you go so early. Oh, good. <laughs> so I'll be taking those with your permission. The first question is, these are questions regarding these, this technique. So is there enough evidence to prove that this technique is free from the problems of masking? Of masking? Yeah, problems of masking. I don't know what that means. Kanika, are you there? Yeah, hi, Dan. Hi, hi. Yeah. hi if you could just uh, elaborate what you mean by masking, 
So I, all I needed to know was that because I've come across certain similar researches which say that sometimes one material masks the chemical identity or the biochemical identity of the other material. So uh, the result is kind of, you know, not so accurate. So that's what I wanted to know about masking. Hmm. I haven't come across anything like that specifically. Um, what, as I mentioned, we can we can look at simple mixtures. So if we in in the the, the very first example I showed, there was egg and there was also um, collagen based material, and so. Yeah. If there's a, a masking, um, we this should be able to be we should still be able to see you know the markers for the material that we're looking for, even within that. The same as we can see, for example, you know egg products with a lot of keratin around. Mm -hmm. So the resolution of the technique is such that um, the simple mixtures can easily be resolved. So if there is a masking material, um, if, if it's a protein, uh, it, would, it would produce its own ions, but we should be able to look you know, within that whole spectrum and determine which ones were, were unknown or maybe a masking and which ones were known. Does that yeah. answer the question? I think it does. Um, at Kanika, is that fine? The fact? Yes, yeah, yes. thank okay. you, Dan. So all she wanted to, all we wanted to know was how specific it is. So if it's able to pick up even, you know, things within mixtures. So I think that answers the question. Well, if, yes, if, if that would be the case. And if, if it were an unknown material, we, mm -hmm. you know, we wouldn't be able to identify it, but we'd be able to say, yes, there's something else in here that is not uh, part of our sample. But at the same time, if you had known materials there or materials that we could identify, Yes, they can be seen in the presence of masking material. In fact, you could, if you want to think about um, the presence of keratin as kind of a, a pretty pervasive uh, contaminant, uh, it's a it's masking in, in that sense. It's an unknown or it's a material that's accidentally included. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The the sub part is um, how accurate. What what is the accuracy rate of this technique? Can we put a number to it? Is it very accurate? These markers, these speaks that one gets, are they very specific? They are very specific, but they're limited. So mm -hmm. the limitation is that we can only identify materials that are in the database. Yeah. So <laughs> if we if it's not in the database, then we we can't exclude it. So if I identify um, a material as um, you know cattle. Mm -hmm. There may be some, there's a lot of other materials that we don't have in the database, which may be similar. So it's always within the context of the database. And there are certain cases, as I mentioned, that we can't distinguish among very closely related uh, critters. But this is all very clearly laid out in, in the, in the, in the uh, references that we use. And as moving forward with the group now that is uh, putting this um, the, the database and um, this uh, a, a, a way of automated looking up or, or um, comparing a spectrum to the database uh, going online. And the, uh, the idea is to have a, a way of having other workers continue to contribute uh, okay. references so that we, that as time goes on, the database grows. Yes. The next question is, uh, are there categories of materials that respond better to, to this technique vis-a-vis -vis others, some that are picked far better and greatly than other materials? Well, they're, if they're proteins, they are all respond pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, when you're dealing with keratins, they, the digestion procedure can, is a little bit more in, involved because keratins are um, highly cross-linked materials and so they have to be treated a little bit differently. But mm -hmm. basically the materials that we'd be interested in, in cultural heritage especially, keratins and collagens pretty much act the same. Keratins are much more diverse and so um, 
I think there maybe are 10 or 15 different kind of collagens uh, used in different parts of, of your body or in, in animals. Uh, and there are probably 10 or 15 times more different types of keratin. So it's a more complicated system, but it still boils down to the same thing. You develop markers and use the markers to identify the material. Um, and when I say developing markers, that means you have to verify by looking at reference materials that the marker that you're saying is for a particular reference material isn't duplicated in the other. So there's quite a bit of background work that has to be done to, to validate uh, these ions that we use as markers. But it's all, for those materials, it's quite the same, yes. Thank you. Are there similar techniques available for cellulosic material? Now we only talked about proteins here. So for cellulosic material, starch, um, and there are there similar techniques available for identifying those? Not that I'm aware of. There are people that are working on gums. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's a group at, um, in Chicago, the uh, Art Institute, who have been developing the same type of technique for gums, gum arabic and, and, and those types of things. Um, but as cellulosic materials, I'm not aware of anyone doing that type of thing. Okay, thank you. I think the next question was about uh, keratin analysis and the challenges or differences involved vis-a-vis -vis collagen uh, analysis. I think that has been partly answered. You did yeah. answer that question that they are difficult to, you know, they are, but, but if you want to take it up again, maybe just mark those. The question is, uh, keratin analysis for species identification using PMF, what are the differences and challenges when compared to collagen analysis? Right, and I, um, I'm going to recommend a, a colleague at, from the uh, Conservation Institute at the Smithsonian who is one of the experts in keratin. I'm going to ask her to get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. She can get a, a uh, a similar talk next time around. Uh, this is Caroline Salazzo, who has been one of the people that's been doing a lot of the keratin work. And she has developed markers, for example, for um, turtle um, material, tortoise-based materials. For, so, and I think she her paper recently had to do with uh, combs, um, combs that are made from tortoise shell. She's done work in um, hair and 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 um, wool type materials, and so it's 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 not as advanced or it's not as far along as the care the collagen work. Um, well, the collagen work really goes back to uh, archaeological uh, projects, oh. and the this idea of using peptide mass fingerprinting or what they call Zoom MS or Zoo MS zoological mass spectrometry. Um, originated with the group at York and um, Manchester, where they wanted to develop a way of differentiating bones from uh, archaeological contexts, uh, where they would be uh, small bones or had no morphological features that they could use. And so the, one of the very first papers from Michael Buckley, and I showed his the reference to that in one of my slides, was to come up with a quick and easy way of identifying the differentiating between sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the very first examples yeah. um, of using this technique. <clears throat> so we in the, the more modern materials are taking advantage of the work that was put into uh, the archeological type of um, needs or studies, but the collagen is identically the same. And so whether it's in an archeological context or a modern uh, book binding, it, it's exactly the same. Um, the question always comes up also, and I'm, maybe someone is gonna answer this or ask this, is why don't we use DNA analysis and the, uh, to do this type of uh, identification? And the reason is that the um, DNA is, is a much more fragile molecule and they don't, they don't um, do well um, or don't, don't survive well. <clears throat> and so the rule of thumb, and this comes from Matthew Collins, is that we use PMF for dead things and we use DNA for living things. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. The next question is from Joyce Townsend. She's asking, have you investigated fixatives used by Edgar Degas 
for his pastels, rarely or never successfully identified. They are thought to be animal glue, egg, milk, or other protein. He worked on the pastels by Edgar Degas. Could yes. you start over again on that? Have you ever, in, have you investigated fixatives used by yes. the artist Edgar Degas and for his pastels? That is the question. Because they are yes. thought to be uh, made of animal glue, egg, milk, or other protein. So any Yes. The example I know is that's Joyce Townsend. She, um, <laughs> she would know. Um, yes, Joyce. I've, I've never met you, but I've been working with John Slavin, and I think you were involved with some of the very original work with the constable fixatives. And since that time, and I think I analyzed the samples that um, you had looked at with IR, and we found that those are fish based. And since then, we've analyzed through John um, Slavin and the uh, the conservator that I mentioned from Scotland, and have have sampled quite a few of these constable sketches, and they're all uh, the fixative on those is all fish based. The other example I showed um, from the Met and um, Bordeaux was um, from the Gainsborough. Um, they, I don't know if they were, I think they were pastels, and I'm not 100% sure, but he used, he used a uh, casein based material, milk based material to uh, preserve the colors and to, as a, as a fixative. <clears throat> and so they have analyzed, uh, they use the, the abrasive um, films in that case. Um, and I think they tried using the erasers and they got some results, but the, the abrasive films were, were better results. And they did that without, um, you know, with, with the full um, permission of the conservators. And they were quite happy that uh, the sampling was completely innocuous, but the results were really pretty spectacular. So yes, fixatives are quite easy. Uh, and all those proteins that would be used as fixatives, the egg layers, um, milk, stuff like that are all, uh, we have markers for all of those and they're very easy to identify. So any work done on Edgar Degas works, pastels, that's what she was referring to. Have you investigated fixatives used by the artist Edgar Degas? No, I've never, I don't, have never been involved in it. <clears throat> I don't go out and seek these things out. <laughs> Usually yeah. I get involved because someone is, you know. Studying something, and yeah. Yep. yep. Thank you. The next question is, uh, can you see some difference in the markers of same animals? depending on the time of the making of the sample object, you know, in the way of bioarchaeology, archaeology, and could they help to date an object? No. Hmm. You can, the peptide mass fingerprinting doesn't say anything about age or sex or any of those. Yeah. Uh, it's and That's an advantage. That's an advantage. If these markers Keep kept changing with age. There's there's no end to it. I think for this analysis. Right. Um, what I will will say is that um, with I showed the example of the um, mummy portraits, hmm. and what we've seen on those, and I didn't I didn't go into this, but I said they are highly degraded, and that means that the the ions that we've seen, one of the one of the types of degradation that you can see with proteins is called deamidation, where the amide containing residues and amide containing amino acids, uh, glutamine and asparagine over time or because of chemical interactions or because of heat or a whole lot of different things that can't be pinned down, they slowly degrade into the, um, the, the, the amide changes into a, a, an OH. Mm -hmm. And that uh, means that there's an increase in mass of one. And so with the mummy portraits, the the normal egg uh, protein markers were all shifted to a higher mass or starting to shift to a higher mass. And we've verified that, the, yes, this is deamidation, hmm. but, um, that, but there's, we can't really use that as a, a way of um, determining age because there's too many uh, factors that go into this particular cause. So the, the the nice thing about collagen is that it's very stable. The bad thing about collagen is that it's very stable and you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, I agree. 
So I had a question. I was looking at the table and uh, few, like it said, there were different markers on the spectrum, but many of them were same for a lot of animal species. Isn't that a problem? Some of the values are like, they were same across the board and there were few, let's say A, D and F were different, but then B or C would be same for a lot of species. Isn't that an issue when you identify a species? It is, it is. So, but we are expanding that. Even, hmm. That was a, that, that chart is almost outdated now because we're filling in some additional species, additional yeah. markers. Yeah. The collagen is quite about 90, I don't know, 99% uh, conserved, the same from any animal. And so most of the ions that you saw in those spectra are the same, but yeah. there are, are actually quite a few that are, we're finding that are different. Yeah. Um, and yes, and so part of this database that we're gonna be putting online will be to uh, encourage people to um, add additional markers as they can find them. And it may not be across the board, <clears throat> but it may be able to, you may be able to within certain groups, yeah. um, use additional markers to differentiate. I've got um, work that I've been doing that shows um, um, with ivory, ivory from elephant and mastodon, uh, the sequences that are published show that it is absolutely, you know, they're absolutely identical. But there's mm -hmm. one ion that I've noticed in those spectra that is different from one to the other. And I'm about ready to publish that as a way of identifying, a way of differentiating uh, mammoth, not mastodon, mammoth ivory from elephant ivory. And oh. so um, you're right, there are a lot of similarities uh, and it really depends on the diversity within the group. Oh. Uh, I, didn't sh I didn't highlight it, but if you looked at the whales and some of the sea mammals, whales especially, we can tell those down to the individual species pretty easily because they're so diverse for whatever reason, as they evolved, their, their diversity was just um, more rapid than some mammals. Hmm. And my final question, how expensive is this uh, equipment if one were to try to procure in terms of other equipment? Is it an expensive uh, um, apparatus to obtain or is it relatively affordable? It's outside of having to have an instrument. I mean, if, and uh, it's extremely, cost effective. You okay. need about um, two square feet of lab space. Hmm. Um, you know, pipettes and, and Eppendorf tubes and things like that. But the only reagents that you need are, are basically, you know, ammonium bicarbonate and trypsin and hmm. moldy matrix. So it's a very inexpensive. And the, um, itself, the instrument itself, the instrument that you would be using for analysis is that also affordable or is it slightly? well they are owning one is can be expensive mm -hmm. uh, renting time on them and most universities or some universities have what they call open access um, instruments that you can use um, and you might have to pay 50 or 100 dollars an hour to run samples but if you were interested in 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 pursuing doing your own analysis i would bet that you can find a university nearby that has an instrument and they would be very eager and happy to work with you because when you you tell them that you're doing this analysis of this art object they get all you know they really are interested in in uh, in helping with that kind of thing the analysis itself um, if i have a plate where i've maybe spotted 10 or 15 samples i can get spectra from all of those within a half hour so it's okay. you know, the, the analysis time is, is very short. Okay. Uh, just last, the lady that you had referred who's working on keratin, I wanted to put that name out there. Can you please spell out her name? It's Caroline. Um, I Solazzo, S-O-L-A-Z-Z-O. And I just sent her an email yesterday with your information and encouraged her to get in touch with you. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Thank you. It'll be nice to have her as one of our speakers. Um, so I put it there, it's Caroline Solazzo. So also I want, I think it's Alison who wanted that reference. So. S-O-L-A-Z-Z-O. Yeah, she's at the 
Yeah, I put that. S O L A Z. Yeah. yeah. Alison has made note of that. So she can contact. She's, her. she's at the Conservation Institute at the Smithsonian. Okay. I hope that helps. So those are the questions. Thank you very much for your time and for being so patient and, and really enjoyed. I personally enjoyed the talk a lot. I think it's a, it's a very new technique, something I, as I said, I wasn't aware of and seems to be quite easy for identification of uh, proteins. So hopefully, as I said, we'll have in the future, we'll get a chance to probably hear you again. And Good. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. So yes, thank you very much, all you folks who have listened in. I hope it was um, useful to you. I'm sure. I think with the question answer sessions, I think a lot of doubts were cleared and people are really excited. Hopefully we'll see. Because I noticed there were not many, you know, species from the Asian context within those markers as well. That shows that I think very little work has been done in this part of the world. So it'd be nice to add a lot of Indian animal species markers and hopefully if people get excited, we might get those samples as well. If you, if you could put me in touch with someone who has access to um, yeah. those materials, I'd be happy to run them and get them in our into our database. But you're right, we're, we're limited um, in a lot of ways, but expanding. Yeah. I think the sampling method is also simple. So I think somebody can just, maybe we can send across some samples and start building the database and start adding to it as well. Yes, so great. Hopefully it will lead to more collaboration and networking as you rightly said. Um, I enjoyed the talk. I think thank you everyone for joining us. Okay. Great day, Dan. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.